very often when we raise a question, is faith outdated or essential? Um, when it boils down to us personally, when we're personally asking it, and we personalize this very big issue, it goes something like this. Why would I need God? Now, depending where you're coming from, um, you might even start off like this. I'm happy as I am. Why do I need God? Now, if that is certainly, if that is the way you're talking about, then we're certainly starting on the same page. Because before I became a Christian, I was very deeply suspicious of Christians. Um, uh, uh, my life seemed very complete. I was very happy. Everything was going very, very well. No one ever asked me to do this. If I'd scored my life, I would have said, I'm doing about eight out of 10. Um, I was very happy. Uh, the idea that the Christian faith might be true and I might have to be a Christian, in my view, would mean dropping from eight out of 10 to two out of 10 in terms of enjoying life. Um, as I said, I was very suspicious of what they were saying. Um, uh, I, I come from a, a family that's always been very, very successful at that time. I would definitely describe my my politics as capitalistic, and I used to feel about Christians the same way I felt about communists at the time. They had nothing, but they wanted to share it with me. And um, <laughs> I, um, uh, I was very suspicious. It wasn't just a question of why do I need God? I'm happy as I am. Uh, by putting in that phrase, I'm happy as I am, I was, actually, I was actually basically saying any response to become a Christian for me would be a severe existential downgrade. And so I want to try and look at it a little bit like that. Now, what is interesting is, and I'm sure you all read these things regularly and stay abreast of them, but in 2004, in one of the world's largest medical journals, an uh, academic um, analysis was published of what was up until that time the largest mental health survey done in the history of the planet. Um, the World Health Organization uh, put together a huge team across a huge range of countries to try to gauge how happy people were um, and also try to gauge their there, where they were mentally and emotionally in life. And they were basically testing for something that we would call emotional distress. At the point of survey, how are you doing? Now, this was, all this research was written up in an article entitled Prevalence, Severity, and Unmet Need for the Treatment of Mental Disorders in the World Health Organization's Mental Health Surveys, which is why it's so fun reading these journals. It's the snappy titles <laughs> they give to their articles. They concluded that actually in some developed countries, at the point of survey, 26.4% of the people being interviewed were suffering from mental distress at point of survey. 26.4%. Now, what does that mean? Well, that means if you came here tonight with three friends and they seem to be perfectly fine, guess who's in trouble? <laughs> now, if you can cast your mind back as far as when David Cameron was elected and made prime minister in this country, one of the very first um, announcements he made, which really struck me as interesting, was saying he wanted to match off government policy against something called SWB, social well-being. And that was also very much born out of some of this thinking. Why is it, especially in affluent countries, the more we have, the more we seem to spend, reported levels of happiness often seem to be in the decline. Now, the UN, World Health Organization, countless organizations and universities around the world have tried to come up with various different measures to say, how are we doing? And the picture is obviously very complicated because it's not as easy as you might initially think. So when we talk about why do we need God, um, there are a couple of things I think allow most people to put it firmly to one side. So let's just deal with one of those first, why we think, and that very much plays into this whole outdated thing. The first one is that actually belief in God is largely illusory. Now, it was Freud in his book, The Future of an Illusion, who argued that the unpredictable forces of nature, the uncertainty that we see in this world, lead us to want to wish there was some kind of personal God, some kind of divine father figure looking out for our best interests. And therefore, what we do is we project this need somehow into ourselves and out there into this world and conclude that he actually exists. And therefore, God, even if he does make you feel better, at the very best, is some kind of illusion. And it, it can be explained through the kind of world in which we live. Now, what's very interesting is a very well-known uh, psychologist by the name of Paul Witz, who published a book called Faith of the Fatherless, decided to have a look at some of the world's leading atheists, Hobbes, Voltaire, Sartre, and Nietzsche, and actually realized that most of them had absent, abusive, or weak, very weak father figures in their life. And he concluded, as a psychiatrist, that atheism is a form of psychological denial. So, we have one group who are saying God is a psychological projection. Okay? You think you need him, therefore you get him. You have another group who are arguing, no, 
Atheism is a form of psychological denial. Now, how would you choose between these two? How would you choose between projection or denial? And the answer is, well, on the basis of truth and reality. That's the only way you can answer that question. The psychology can't answer it. The psychiatry can't answer it. The only way to answer that question isn't by looking at different psychological or psychiatric schools. It has to be on the basis of reality. If there is no God and people believe in him, it's clearly some form of projection or wish fulfillment. If he is there and we're saying he isn't, then it must be some form of denial. But the only way you can reliably come to any conclusion between those two is by accessing, well, what is the truth? What is the reality? So the argument to somehow try and put God to one side because it's purely illusory, that's, that's not going to work from a psychological or psychiatric argument. We're going to actually have to come back to an argument about truth and reality. Now, that then moves us into a whole other sphere, which is why people feel they can very happily conclude that clearly there can be no God, because the argument there would be, well, God is both philosophically and scientifically unnecessary. We just don't simply need him in the way we used to. We now understand things much better, and we actually have a much clearer view of the world, and God is manifestly unneeded. Now, if we were to put this in very colloquial terms, we'd say something like this. Science in particular, and the laws of science, have displaced God. There's simply no need for that hypothesis, that idea, or such a being anymore. He's redundant. Okay, maybe in the past, people needed to appeal to him to explain certain things, deal with certain things. We just don't need to do that anymore. Now, I have the privilege of working with two um, people who are far more... Um, uh, brilliant than I am, both um, Oxford University professors, Professor Alistair McGrath and Professor John Lennox, who've both written extensively in this area. And if you want to read in this area, um, then I would suggest digging up some of their books. Most of them are bestsellers. But let's just deal at a very popular level with this argument that God can't exist because he would break the laws of science. And we know what the laws of science are, and they're unbreakable. And therefore, if God were to exist and he were to be in conflict with them, his existence can't be there. Now, the problem is what we have here is what we would call philosophically a category error. Now, let me explain what I mean by that. Now, it was C.S. Lewis in a very popular way. He dealt with this a long time ago. What he said was, he said, look, you cannot use this argument. We're breaking the laws of science to disprove God. And he says, and it's very easy to illustrate why. He said, look, supposing you open your bedside table and you put in 2,000 pounds in your bedside table because that's how much cash you need if you're going to buy a few friends a cup of Starbucks. And depending on what happens with the value of the pound... Uh, we may need to adjust that figure in the near foreseeable future. And let's suppose in the next day, because you forgot to take the cash out of your bedside table, you will draw some more cash from the ATM, another £2,000, because you're expecting another Starbucks or Costa trip anytime soon. And once again, you spend nothing. So you, when, when you get back from home, once again, as you're undressing yourself, you remove all the money from your pockets and so on, as is your custom, you put it in your bedside table. Okay, so you add another £2,000 in. On day three, you open the drawer... You look inside and you only see 1,000 pounds. Now, he said, what would you conclude? I was giving this illustration in Hong Kong a couple of years ago, and a man from the back of the room yelled out that my family have gone shopping. <laughs> now, if there is no one else in your house and you're living alone, when you open the drawer and you see there's only 1,000 pounds there, you do not say, oh my goodness, the laws of mathematics have been broken. That's not your conclusion. The law of the land has been broken. Someone came into your house and took 3,000 pounds out of your bedside table when you weren't looking. Here's the question. How do you detect the presence of a thief? The answer is 2 plus 2 always equals 4. Without exception, without anything else, it always is. That's how you can detect the presence of an outside agent in order to see he broke in and did something. If sometimes 2 plus 2 equaled 1, you could never come reliably to that conclusion. The fact that 2 plus 2 equals 4 doesn't somehow make the presence of a thief impossible to see. It's the means by which we detect his presence. It is because we live in a scientifically regulated and governed universe, it is possible to detect outside interference in it. If we didn't live in a universe of fixed regulated laws of maths and science and so on, it would be impossible to detect any outside interference. There would be no grounds to reliably come to that conclusion. So trying to argue from the fixity of the laws, does that make sense? To say, look, no one can come in and break them, that's to make a, a, a rather important um, error at that point. Do you see that? It's only because we live in the type of universe we can that we're ever able to detect some form of outside interference. Let's suppose you have to take this, this notebook that I'm speaking from and toss it out into the audience, especially if I put my uh, strap around it to reduce air um, resistance. Well, every time I throw it, this book 
will travel in a beautiful parabolic curve in an equation that was taught to me when I was seven and a half years old. And if I know the angle of departure from my hand and the velocity, well, I can then predict with complete accuracy where it will land every single time. Let's suppose, however, I throw the book out into the audience and it flies up and it just then suspends midair. I don't stand around going, my goodness, look at that, the law of gravity is being broken right now. No, something that I cannot see or someone I cannot see is applying an equal and opposite force to it. Well, how do I come to that conclusion? Well, basic physics. I know what the equations are. The fact it's being suspended midair doesn't mean that the equations don't apply. It's because of those equations that something I cannot see or, something, or someone I cannot see is doing something to hold it there. The laws of science reveal and make it possible to detect outside intervention. They don't make it impossible. And so to try to use this argument to somehow discount God is, is an error. Now, the other way in which these laws are sometimes used would go something like this. Well, look, because we understand how things work now in much more detail, we don't need God to come along and explain them to us. But this is now where you can begin to see what will be called the category agency error in its most clear form. If I were to uh, put any, well, let's take my house in Oxford. It's a very simple house. It was built in the 1800s. Uh, it's still standing. It has all of its original plumbing, which is why when you have a shower in my house, it's like an old man dribbling on your head. <laughs> now, why is it still standing? Well, my house, I can answer that question, and indeed everything else about it, through very, very simple mathematics. My house looks like the kind of house children draw. There's a door in the middle. There's a window either side. It's made up of right angles. It's got a pitched roof on the top. I don't need to invoke any kind of complex or mysterious theory to explain why it's standing. Does the fact that I have an exhaustive, total, complete scientific narrative to understand why it's standing and everything else mean that therefore there can be no architect? And the answer is no. It's not capable of doing that. And so again, to try to argue from the fact, well, look, if we had a complete, exhaustive, scientific, mechanically understood set of mathematical equations to explain every known thing in this universe, even if we had such a set of things, which we would aspire to, but we don't have yet, but even if we did, is that capable, therefore, and good grounds to say there is no God? Well, no, because it's not capable of disproving agency. They're two different things. So the argument philosophically can't even get off square one which is um, something that often seems to pass. Anyway, some people buy, but let's not belabor that point. Now, if God can't simply be dis dismissed as an illusion, and if he can't just simply be dismissed as unnecessary, we have then this last thing about felt need, um, which, as I say, certainly where I came. No felt need. Well, I, I don't need him. Now, the difficulty with this line of argument is it assumes that I know what I need and what I want, and I can distinguish between the two. Now, this is something which is very difficult to do. When I uh, studied economics about 185 years ago, uh, we were all taught about something called the rational consumer. Now, I don't know if there are any economists in the room, but the upshot of most of our e economic research for the last 20 or 30 years proves there is no such person. As a matter of fact, we will all make self-defeating choices again and again, even when we actually know the choice isn't good for us. This whole idea that we make choices which are so-called bilaterally and voluntary and informed, um, bilaterally, voluntary and informed, means, informed means, we know our mind, we know our ultimate good, and we know all of the options before us. Voluntary means I'm aware of all of my motives. And of course, what we realize is that's largely fictional. It is very difficult to distinguish between want and need. So when I say I need an iPhone to do what I do, we have to be very careful about how we actually understand that. The biggest issue, however, and this is really where I'd like to try and pull this together, when it comes to this question about, well, look, I'm just simply happy as I am. No matter how you approach this, the, simply, the simple truth is I'm perfectly happy perfectly content, and I have absolutely no need of this. Now, when you say you're happy as you are, you're actually saying making quite a profound statement. It's probably one of the questions which we're going to find most politically challenging in the next 20 to 30 years. 
this question about what does it mean when we actually just say, say we're, that we're human, and how do we answer the question, who am I? Now, there was a thinker from a long time ago, a um, brilliant Catholic writer called G.K. Chesterton, who made an observation, I think back in the 40s or 50s, which the first time I came across it, I haven't been able to get it out of my mind ever since, and I did not read it when it was first published. G.K. Chesterton said, you know, when you, speak to, when you listen to a politician speak, they'll very often say something like this. Our country is sick. Our nation is sick. Things are bad. Vote for me, and I'll make things better. He says, and we use this, like, loose medical analogy. He says, but it's a very totally misplaced, he said. He says, when you go in the field of medicine and you go to the hospital, the doctors may disagree with themselves about why you're ill. So they might have a big argument about the, the true illness that you're battling. But all of the doctors will be united about what a healthy body looks like. So the doctors, by necessity, may send you home with one leg less. But they will never, in a strange creative rapture, send you home with one leg more. <laughs> so the doctors in medical science, they may disagree about the illness, but they're all totally agreed on what does a healthy body look like. But in political science, it's very different. In political science, we seem very happy to agree something's seriously wrong. We need to fix it. What we can't actually agree on is what the good looks like. It's because we can't define what does it mean to live in a healthy society, what does it mean to be a fulfilled individual, that we actually tear each other's political eyes out. And what one party comes along and suggests is a solution to this ill, to another party, the solution which is proposed is worse than the problem it seeks to address. And so it's because we, we struggle to answer this question, what is a healthy society, what does a healthy human look like, that we actually find ourselves with some very serious problems. Now, what the Christian faith has to say about this particular issue is really actually quite profound. And it's a very personal question, so let me just start off by outlining a personal answer. Uh, I, wasn't, uh, I was born in the United Kingdom, but I was raised most of my childhood in the Middle East. Um, uh, sometimes people, when they're listening to me, they wonder where my British accent comes from, and they're trying to place what part of the UK am I hail from. And I can say that very simply. This is the voice of the BBC World Service. <laughs> um, that's what I listen to in Riyadh, in Saudi Arabia. Now, as an old attained teenager, we, my parents moved to Cyprus. And at that point, I really only had one goal in life, and that was to be cool. I wanted to be happy, I wanted to be fulfilled, I wanted my life to make sense and come together. And as far as I could see from all the movies I'd extensively watched, and I watched a very large number of movies, coolness and being cool was the secret to being fulfilled. I did everything that I saw in the movies. I smoked large cigars, a particular hero of mine who's produced an amazing body of work in the film industry, a man by the name of Arnold Schwarzenegger, uh, was prone to doing so. I wanted to be like him, uh, so that's what I did. I, I used to have a silver cigarette case to carry my cigarettes around in. James Bond had a silver cigarette case. He was cool. I wanted to be like him. I had one. It's quite embarrassing, but I, um, you know when you have a box of matches, you have that little strip on the side to light the match? Well, I used to remove that strip and stick it to the bottom of my shoe. <laughs> so having opened my cigarette case and flicked a cigarette into my mouth, I could lean against a wall, take a match, and light it on the bottom of my shoe like I've seen Clint Eastwood do in countless <laughs> westerns who, for me, was the coolest man on the planet. There's a story told that he was being interviewed once by a press reporter, and the press reporter said to him, why does everyone think you're so cool? And he took a little cigar out of his pocket, put it on the edge of the table, flicked it so it started spinning in the air. As it was spinning in the air, he caught it in his mouth, produced a match from his back pocket, struck it under the table, lit the cigar, inhaled very deeply, blew a big smoke ring, three little smoke rings through the big one, and said, I don't know. When we ask this question, how do I understand who I am? When I talk about being happy with who I am and happy as I am, no need for any change, any correction, we're actually asking one of the most profound and important questions. And the interesting thing is we seem to live in a world where most of us are actually trying to be someone else or feel that we have to become someone else. At the same time, we wonder if true change is actually ever possible. Now, this is not a new question at all. If you've read Mary Shelley's book, Frankenstein, um, now, I haven't seen any of the movies, I have to confess, um, but I have good grounds to believe the book is probably better. The, um, Mary Shelley, as an atheist, 
addresses this question, actually, incredibly profoundly. The being that Dr. Frankenstein creates, because Frankenstein isn't the name of the being that's created. Frankenstein's the name of the doctor who creates this strange being. The being that Frankenstein creates is very benign. It's born into this world, benign, kind, reflective, thoughtful, but ugly. It's quite big, and it's quite ugly. If it helps you to use me as a visual image at this point, go ahead. And here's what happens. As the being copies more and more human behavior, as it has more and more human interaction, it becomes increasingly, increasingly, increasingly disillusioned and then eventually cynical and violent. There's a fascinating scene where the doctor and the being are talking to each other. And this new being turns to its creator and says, when I first came into this world, I couldn't figure out why human beings needed laws or rules or regulations or even government. He says, but the more I read of your history, the more I read your literature, the more I survey or observed your behavior, my wonder ceased and I turned away in disgust and loathing. He said, to be a human being seems to be the most noble thing on this planet and at the same time the most vicious and base. And then he says, all I can conclude is this. Human beings were created in the image of something perfect and they've fallen away from it. Then he goes on to say, I, however, seem to have been created in the image of something imperfect, and how much greater then will my own fall be? And this is an incredibly profound statement coming from Mary Shelley, who had very decidedly rejected her Christian faith. Her father was a vicar. And at a quite early age, while she was at university, she rejected it, and at the time became one of Britain's most notorious atheists. The simple truth is, is that when we talk about the question, who am I, we're asking an essential question. It demands an essential answer. And if we're true about what we actually see inside us, there are things there that we wish, that we wish weren't. Now, the Bible refers to this as the fall, the idea that all human beings have fallen. Now, this is seen as being negative by a lot of people. So let me just say two things. Number one. If you're sat in this room tonight and you honestly believe that you're perfect, there's nothing wrong with you, you never do anything wrong, you are perfect, there's only one way out of that state of self-deception. You must get married. <laughs> Number two. When we talk about the fall, this isn't some kind of slander on human nature that some people have talked about. It is actually really quite profound. Life would be very simple if there were good people and bad people. If there were good people and bad people, you could pass simple pieces of legislation to keep bad people out and lock good people in. And I won't be taking any questions on that this evening. But the truth is actually rather more complicated than that. The simple truth is, is every human heart shows the tendency for both. All of us. My um, eldest daughter, she's currently 17, um, She's a very avid reader. Um, she had read almost quite a lot of Jane Austen's works by the age of eight and was asking us all kinds of interesting literary questions out of what she was reading. And a few years ago, about three years ago, I was heading off on a long overseas trip, and um, she'd been growing her hair. And it, she'd grown it all the way down to the bottom of her spine, so it's now hanging, you know, it's incredibly long. And as I was getting ready to go on the trip, she looked at me and she said, Dad, you better be ready for a shock, because when you get back, my hair's going to be shorter. I said, okay. Anyway, I knew things were going to be interesting because when I landed at the airport, even before I got home, when I was on my way back, my wife rang me and said, when you come home, you are to say nothing to Lucy apart from, you look beautiful. <laughs> so an hour or so later, I'm knocking on my, my door um, in Oxford, and my daughter opens the door, and her hair's been cut up to here. I'm a man under authority. I do what I'm told. <laughs> I said, Lucy, you look beautiful. Now, a couple of days later, my wife was out. She leads the cello section in a local orchestra in Oxford, and they were doing rehearsal. And now I'm alone with my daughter, and we're watching the news together, and I finally have the opportunity I've been rather hoping I'll have for a while. Okay. So I want to ask the question. So I start breathing gently in and out just to make sure everything is calm. <laughs> and then I smile because I want the tone to be perfect. And as casually as I can, I turn to her and say, so... What prompted this, this change? Were you bored, fashion, want to try something new? 
And she said, well, she said, I saw this documentary a couple of months ago about this charity that works with young girls, six and seven year old girls who have leukemia. And they were saying one of their problems is, is that they can't find enough hair donors so they can make wigs for these girls as they lose their hair. And so a few days after I'd left, she had a hairdresser come around, a friend of our, who we know, and plaited her hair in a special way and they tied it off and cut it and she'd mailed it off to this charity. Um, and obviously with the length of her hair, uh, they were able to make multiple wigs you know, for some of these girls. And um, one of the books that my daughter had recently read was entitled Little Women. And uh, if any of you are familiar with that story, the heroine of that novel, quite a feisty young lady, has her hair cut off and sells it so she can buy a train ticket so her mother can go and visit her father who's dying in a military hospital hundreds of miles from home. And as the mother takes the money, she looks at her daughter and says, your hair will regrow, but you'll never be more, more beautiful to me than you are right now. And as Lucy told me what she had done, I, I said, Lucy, do you remember reading Little Women? And she said, yes. And I quoted this line to her. I said, this is the only line I can think of say, to, to describe how I feel right now. When we talk about the idea of a fallen human heart, we don't mean that, that we never see anything good, noble, great in any human heart. What we're actually saying is actually there's something much more complex picture. We actually see all these things woven up in every human heart. In that same heart, we also can see greed, anger, malice, lust. And it's all there together. It's very easy to be a saint until someone cuts you up on the motorway. And at that point, you're sitting there thinking how nice it would be to have missile launchers behind your number. <laughs> we all have these capacities. The greatest challenge at one level, at this fundamental level that's faced by the human race, has always been the same. Is there anything or anyone who is actually capable of changing and transforming us? And this is now what the heart of the Christian gospel is about. The Christian message isn't you need to think better thoughts or have nicer feelings or try to try harder and do good things. The message is actually much more profound. Jesus Christ came to say, I'm not here to offer you a new way to think, a new way to feel, or to tell you to do try harder. He said, I, I'm here, he says, to change and radically transform the human heart. We don't need a transformation simply of your thinking or of your feeling or of your doing. We need someone who can transform and change your very existence. And at this point, Jesus Christ is saying something which is unique amongst all ancient religious figures. In all other um, religious uh, systems, and including in many of our contemporary ones, our narrative goes something like this. Look, there is something wrong. We need to change it. If you change the way you think, if you change the way you feel, if you change what you do, Eventually, you can become the person you need to be. And so there's a path, does that make sense? From one state to another. But what Jesus actually said is there is no such path. There is no way to get from there to there. He said, what you actually need is someone who doesn't just simply change the way you think or feel or do. You need someone who's actually capable of changing your very being, your very heart. You need something that will totally transform you. He says, and that's what I've come to do. There was a very famous um, uh, uh, writer and psychologist, I haven't even checked to see if he's alive, I'm pretty sure he is, um, by the name of Oliver Sacks. Um, he, he did all of his uh, postgraduate work in Oxford and then went over to the States. And he wrote, written a lot of books, some of them have been made into films. So if you haven't read Awakenings, which is one of his books, you can, it was made into a film with Robert De Niro. Again, the book is better. And interestingly, um, Oliver Sacks, I think it's on, you have to forgive me, I'm tired, I think it's page 23 or 26 of that book. He says something like this. He says, all of us have a basic intuitive feeling that once we were whole and well, at ease, at peace, at home in this world, totally united with the grounds of our being, and that somehow we lost this primal, happy, innocent state, and we fell into our sickness and suffering. We had something of infinite preciousness and beauty, and we've lost it. We spend the rest of our lives searching for that which we have lost, hoping one day we will suddenly find it. Now, how do you like that? A hundred years of psychological research, several hundred billion dollars spent, we finally got as far as Genesis chapter 3. Because actually, that is the biblical story. We have lost something. We need something that's actually capable of changing the human heart and the very frame of our being and to transform us. 
Not just something that says, change the way you think, change how you feel, change what you do. Something that's actually capable of changing who we are. Which is why Jesus Christ said, if anyone comes to me, they are a new creation. He was offering to take something and actually make it completely new. And this is without either parallel or precedent right across the ancient world. And it's something he's been doing today.